If you're not doing so, I want to encourage you to be involved in our daily Bible reading program. I have really been encouraged with how many of you have told me that you're uh, taking on the challenge of reading the Bible through in a year. It's really not that difficult unless you get behind. It's only about three chapters a day, which is, takes about ten minutes or so. And uh, I have a little app on my phone that reads the Bible to me. And so if, if I'm in the car, you know, or out somewhere waiting in a waiting in a line or waiting room or something, put those earbuds in, I can listen for the day. Or it really helps if you don't know how to pronounce all those names. All you can do is read along and listen, and, and the person who's reading it just goes right over those names, and you don't have to try to sound them out for yourself. But of course, the main blessing is what it will do to your heart and what it will do to mine as we absorb and feed upon God's Word. I'm trying to also encourage you by letting our lessons that we do each Sunday morning be right out of your reading. So if you've been trudging through the book of Job and you made it through it to the end, as you would have if you were following the schedule. By the way, you can pick one out in the lobby if you don't have one. Just pick up where we are and go from here. The book of Job has really challenged us. And uh, it's really been um, a, a book that when you really see the progression of it, it comes alive to you. So let's consider then... The second part of a two-part lesson, we started Job last Sunday, and we will continue today. Listen to this particular quotation. Let's go to the next slide. So I am, now this is Job as he's speaking. So I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long, and I am full of tossing until the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt, and my skin hardens, then breaks out afresh. Now that's just grotesque to think about, isn't it? To think about this kind of miserable night that for months that Job had to endure. It's like one of those nights where you can't sleep and you keep looking at the clock and you say, you mean it's only 2? It's only 2.15? It's 2.30? The night keeps on going. You're tossing and turning. You keep looking at the clock and you're ready for daylight to come. It doesn't come. But then let's add to that that the reason that Job can't sleep is because he's empty and he's miserable, and he's in pain. So there's a very real physical and emotional reason why Job can't sleep. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. What a sad picture of a man who's really enduring a hard time. In Job 6 and verse 1, If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sands of the sea. Wow. What a desperately miserable place Job was, was taken to in, in his misery. We do not know exactly what illness afflicted Job, but the descriptions here and in other places indicate that it was extremely painful. He found no relief day or night. The oozing sores healed over and then broke out again. Again, grotesque, descriptive. We can only imagine how miserable that Job really was. From last week's lesson, we considered that Satan's onslaught of calamity against Job attacked most everything that was precious to him, and really, to all human beings. His possessions were taken from him, his livelihood, his reputation. If you read the book of Job, you'll see when it says when people saw him, they spit on him or they, they ignored him. His servants wouldn't pay any attention to him anymore he completely lost all of his reputation. Most painfully, all of his children were taken from him. They all died in a single day. And we weighed that in our minds last week and considered what it would be like not just to lose one child, but to lose all of them in a single day. 
And then finally, he lost his health. It's difficult enough to deal with stress when you're healthy. To deal with crisis in your life when you feel good. But if you add to it all this calamity that came upon it, add that upon him, add that to, he was miserable. He didn't feel well. He was sick. He was in pain. You add those two together and it comes out to be a very tragic living for him. Although Job did not sin against God, his confusion as to why God was allowing his great suffering is clearly seen. And in Job 7, the Bible says, Job speaking, Will you never turn your gaze away from me, nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done? O watcher of men, why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? So as we look at the outline that we began last week, we considered the great character of Job. Job was an upright man. He was blameless. He lived a good life. And he was so conscientious about living a good life that he offered sacrifices on behalf of his children just in case they might have cursed God and not known they had done it or repented of it. He was a good man. Consideration. The great scene where Satan presents himself in the presence of God and they consider or they have a conversation about Job. And then the great calamity. We considered all these three last week. Let's consider now this large section of the book of Job. Chapter 2 verse 11 all the way through almost the end of the book. The comforters and the confusion. Now we might put a big question mark by comforter because we can really learn a lot by reading the book of Job of how to not be a comforter. We can learn a lot of things about what not to say and how not to handle things. So if you're looking for some tips on how to comfort people in hospital visits or people who are suffering or having trouble, don't take up the three friends here of Job and use them as a template for comfort. But unless we're too hard on Job's friends, let's consider them. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and to comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance... They could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. I would like for you to consider with me that Job's three comforters really appear to be genuine and well-intended. Consider all these different, different ideas concerning these comforters. First, they left their own homes and their own families to travel and to meet together in order to go and to try to comfort Job. That's pretty noble, isn't it? They left for an extended time. We know that at least they were there with him for a, for a week without speaking. They wept when they saw Job's condition and the depth of his suffering. It doesn't appear that they go and they're all stoic and they come in and they're all judgmental and they're looking down their noses at Job and they begin with this long uh, monologue of different criticisms against him at first. It appears at first they go and they're, they're genuine and they're sympathetic and, and they weep with Job because they knew the Job before, the healthy Job The successful Job, the prosperous Job, the faithful Job, the man who had a good life. Things were going well for him. And now they've come together to visit him as friends. And then look, and he's lost his family. He's lost his possessions. And he's suffering and he's in pain and he's he's miserable. And that hurts them enough that they, they weep. And they sat in silence for seven days and seven nights. Now, 
One place I read said that this was customary, that guests in this kind of situation wouldn't speak until first the sufferer were to speak. So they were waiting for Job to speak first, which he finally does. But even if we just ignore all of that, we can see that's a long time to sit with someone and not say anything, but just be there. And sometimes that's the best way to comfort someone. When I was doing some preacher training at Harding, one very well-respected man who was teaching us preacher boys said the best thing to do when visiting someone who's suffering is to show up and shut up. That was his idea. That really it's not so much what you say, it's being there with someone that makes the real impact. And so we see this kind of comfort happening here. They sat in silence with him for seven days. They wept with him. They were close to him. We might say they loved him. Initially, Job's friends then seemed to urge Job to kind of pinpoint what he's done. So they, they begin these ideas of persuasion. Okay, Job, you're going to have to think here. What did you do that caused this? Think about it. Pinpoint it. Figure it out. Put a, a pin there where you can figure out why this is happening to you. Change it and then things are going to be okay. Job can't think of anything. Not that he thinks of himself as a perfect man, but he can't think of anything that deserves this level of punishment by God. So first, they ask him to pinpoint. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed, his friends asked Job. According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. So what does this mean? You sow what you reap, Job. So you've done something. Let's sit down together as friends. Let's figure out what it is. You repent of it and things are going to be okay. They're going to be better. Next in our outline is this idea then of great confusion. Because Job cannot think of what he could have possibly done that would be equal to the great tragedy that's come upon him. It is clear that Job was very confused by the depth of his suffering. He was frustrated by God's silence. He was grieved over his loss and in despair over his physical misery. He couldn't think of what he had done to deserve this. And he desired an audience with God to plead his case. Don't you think this is one of the ways that Satan can destroy a godly person's faith? Is to have him have all these why questions that God seems silent in his answers. There's no answer. Doesn't seem fair. What's going on here? And although we know the whole story and that we can know that there was this consideration or conversation between God and Satan concerning Job. Job didn't know this. He just knew that one day everything was great and suddenly the next day everything was horrible. What happened? Why did this happen to me? What have I done to deserve this? And so he desires to plead his case before God. And as we march through the book of Job, we see the intensity grow. There's more frustration on Job's part. His friends become a little more harsh and hard with Job. And this tension builds, which starts out as comfort, and they're sitting with him, and they're, they're in silence, and they're weeping with him. And they begin to get, become a little bit obstinate. And they get a little harder on Job. And Job pushes back. And there's, there's one place, I don't have a quotation marked for you, where Job says, well, when I finish, you can just mock on Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. The depth of Job's despair broke his spirit. 
I think it's pretty obvious that he became depressed. He pondered why the wicked thrived while he perished. Now there's a question many have. Why do the righteous suffer? And as Job looked around and saw his misery, he saw all those who had no respect for God at all thriving in their lives. Why am I suffering when I've been striving to live a righteous and blameless life? When I look around at all these other people and they're living in wickedness, they have no regard for God at all and they're prospering. So Job says, my spirit is broken and my days are cut short. The grave awaits me. God has made me a byword to everyone, a man in whose face people spit. My eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not upon them. They sing to the music of the tambourine and harp, and they make merry with the sound of the flute. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say, leave us to God. Leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. And so Job is there. He's in great loss, he's in pain, he's miserable, and he looks around and says, why are all these people who have no regard for you at all having great lives, peaceful lives, grandchildren around them, being merry and happy? I don't understand this. Lord, if you could just give me an opportunity to be in your presence and talk to you about this, I think I could persuade you that this isn't fair. This isn't right. Now, in the midst of all this, while this is all going on, Job's seemingly well-intended friends, they kind of change their tone. They become harsh. They even become scathing and very cutting with their words. And if you have read this, you will know. I'll give you a sample. This one is the most horrible one of all, and it's early on in chapter 8. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Now, the New Living Translation says, Your children must have sinned against him, so their punishment was well deserved. Now, that's a way to comfort somebody, isn't it? Let's start off by letting me tell you, you know, you've just lost all your children. They deserved it. That's pretty harsh, wouldn't you say? terrible how about this one but a witless man can no more become wise than a wild donkey's coat colt can be born a man if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent then you will lift up your face without shame that's kind of like name calling isn't it that's pretty harsh And Job says, will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I also could speak like you if if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head against you. In other words, you know, if the situation was reversed, I could stand where you are and look down my nose and I could say all the fine speeches, the harsh things that you're saying to me. I could wag my head or shake my head in your face too. Take out your Bibles now and let's read from Job 22. Job 22, verses 5 through 11. More accusations then that are made, this one by Eliphaz, beginning in verse 5, and I'm using the New International Version today, through verse 11. Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? 
you demanded security from your brothers for no reason. You stripped men of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary. And you withheld food from the hungry. Though you were a powerful man owning land, an honored man living on it, you sent widows away empty-handed. You broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you, and why it is so dark that you cannot see, and why a flood of water covers you. You can feel the tension, can't you? What started out as gentle comfort, sitting in silence, has ended in scathing rebuke. A whole listing of different things are put forth. You didn't pay any attention to the hungry people. You didn't feed them. You were prosperous. You ignored widows. All kinds of things are just dumped upon Job. There's great confusion and great comfort given by friends. Let's go now to our last point. And that is clarity. But I have to warn you. It's not really the kind of answer that we human beings appreciate all the time. The clarity is not as we might have expected. It was not specific answers to all of Job's why questions. Job does get his moment in God's presence. It does happen, which is what Job wanted. But God, rather than specifically answering every one of Job's why questions, he points to an emphatic declaration of his sovereignty. Now this is really important. This is really the whole message of the book of Job. It is an emphasis of God's sovereignty. Now let's look at Job chapter 38. All the way to the end, Job 38, verses 1 through 13. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. And he said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off the dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the seas behind doors when it burst forth from the womb and when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in its place, and when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt." Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? And on and on the Lord goes with all of these glorious things that God can do that illustrate His sovereignty, His absolute right to do as He wills. And Job is there and he is suddenly without lectures. There's no more long, frustrating, desperate words from Job given anymore. As God speaks. I like this one, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Okay, tell me if you understand. Turn now to chapter 40, verses 1 through 10.
the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like His? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. It's really not the kind of answer that we as human beings like. Because we want to know every single explanation to every single thing that happens. And at some point, we've got to realize that the best answer sometimes is, God is God, He is sovereign, He acts justly and rightly, and we must rest in trust in His arms. And that's the only answer there is. There cannot be, or there isn't, or we can't comprehend, or we can't bear what the reality that's going on is. And therefore, we rest in God's sovereignty. I like verse 4. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. Don DeWilt has written in Romans, realized God's creatures should not presume to question Him. They must take for granted that He acts justly. He has the absolute right to do what He does. And since He cannot do wrong, He must not be questioned. In Romans chapter 9, verses 19 and 20, we looked at this back in our Romans study several years ago. One of you will say to me, well then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? You see, it really is about God's sovereignty and our willingness to trust him. Job did not know all that was going on in the spiritual realm, that actually God was proud of him. And that God had presented him to Satan and to say, have you considered Job? You can throw everything you want to at Job. You can take away everything in his life. And he will still be my man. Now wouldn't you like for God to be able to say that about you? It doesn't matter, Satan, what you do to whatever you do, he's going to withstand the test. He's my man. She's my woman. She's faithful. She's going to endure. Was Job discouraged? Yes. Did he have questions? Of course. But when everything was all said and done, do you know what ends up happening? God talks to the three friends and says, you have not spoken about what is right. If Job will pray for you, I'll forgive you. What do you think about that? That's quite a turn of events, isn't it? And so God forgives the folly of the three friends Because Job prays for them. The very man they had said was wicked. And God forgives them. And then of course the end of the story which is so beautiful is God restores ten more children. And he lives a long time in prosperity. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Brothers and sisters, it is foolish for God's people to live their lives in denial of the spiritual realm. We have got to consider how that Satan will destroy marriages, will discourage our children, will take away our health, will bring death into our lives and people around us who are close to us. All the things that Satan can do 
We are foolish if we deny or go through life blindly that those things are happening in order to destroy who we are as God's people. Satan desires to destroy our faith by whatever means is at his disposal. And he certainly will. Satan may even use well-meaning friends and comforters to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Sometimes I cringe when I hear the things that people say to people, to other people. Well, we're going to have to just get over that, but sometimes we may have to do like Job and just put our hands over our mouth. These well-meaning friends, they seem to be well-meaning. God is very specific and says two different times that they did not speak what was right about the Lord when they spoke to Job. Comforters must tread carefully when speaking on God's behalf. Letting the Bible speak is always man's best option. And here these men came in and they were speaking on behalf of God and they got it wrong. It's better to let God's word speak for itself. That's always the best option. And so finally, God is faithful. That's a wonderful message from Job. He's faithful to Job. God is just. He gets it right every time. No mistakes. And God is sovereign. His will is supreme. We must rest in trust. Even when all those why questions come into our lives, when we don't understand what's happening, when we want to argue our case before God, remember, God is always faithful He is always just. He does the right thing every time. God is sovereign. His will must be done and we must honor Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this great book of Job You've given us to remind us of Your justice, to remind us of Your faithfulness, to teach us how to comfort and how not to comfort to make us aware of the spiritual struggle that is a reality in this world, that we can guard ourselves against those ways that Satan would seek to destroy our lives, but to rest in you through every test and to always be faithful to you, that when the time of trial comes upon our lives, that we as Job will stand the test. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to respond this morning, will you come as we stand? Will you come?